you know, then I read Lee Phillips's Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts, and that was a huge conversion experience for me. And then it's funny, right? So like right after that, I write this piece for Invisible Oranges, a heavy metal publication, not too long after that, uh, which was sort of me recycling every single left point I could into a single piece about the Vans Warp Tour. And it was like, I remember finishing it and being like, I don't know if I believe anything I just wrote. Anyway, send it to the editor. You know, it has some of the same like environmental pessimism in it and like all of these, these other things. And it was sort of the thing that I had to write to get that out of my system and then start thinking for myself. Part of that's felt a little bit more phenomenologically real to me because at the time I was writing that, like when I was driving to Colorado, like New Mexico was basically burning down. Like as we were driving, crossing the state line, we watched a wildfire like move over the lip of a mountain, you know? And it's hard not to have like kind of apocalyptic feelings when you see that for the first time. I went through a very kind of like, you know, typical like environmentalist phase where I was like, oh, the world is ending and it's a real, it's a problem. So I, I, I kind of sort of my initial reaction was like, it's all because of globalization and global this and that. So I, I had a very kind of, we need to localize everything. Right? I very much understand the Extinction Rebellion people. I get it. I really do. Let me put it this way. There seems to be like a minimum program of ideas that people work for Extinction Rebellion and who vibe with Extinction Rebellion uh, agree to. And part of it is the pessimism and the apocalypticism, right? I think that's fair to say. I would be, I don't think there's anybody who's involved with that group that's like, you know what's great? Growth. You know, <laughs> like, you know, I'd love to see more industry in the world. And so I just had to ask myself really basic questions. And then once I could start there, you know, you start to be like, oh, okay, like concrete is just a thing that we're gonna have for a long time. And it's very carbon intensive and that's just the way it is, you know? And so like that started to shift my perspective on things like green policy, right? Because if we're like the developing world has to like have all these solar things, I'm like, well, yeah, those aren't energy intensive enough for things like the concrete they need to have like infrastructure to where they can survive climate crises. No one in the degrowth literature is really taking seriously the question of state, states and state power, which is like, you know, like where a lot of us in the socialist left have been thinking really seriously about how, what should our relationship to state power be? Well, it's because they're all, they're all an NGO world. They're all like either in academia or, or uh, civil society. And they point out that, that the reason for that is most of degrowth, uh, philosophy and activism comes out of anarchisms, but their whole theory is that what's going to happen is we're going to start these degrowth uh, uh, projects <laughs> that are going to happen in communities, right? And they say that we're just going to try to attract participants and the participants are going to start to spread the good word <laughs> about these projects. And, 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 and that's going to just sort of cascade and create a new common sense. And it's, it's like their theory, their agent of change is participants in their degrowth projects. And it's just like, no, that's not gonna work. It's monkey wrenching. This is what I was just learning about the other day, monkey wrench, which is, um, cause I was looking up this anarchist, this Edward Abbey, right. I mean, this was like a tactic of environmental anarchists was to just stop things in their tracks, which, you know, is good if you use it strategically, I guess, for really bad shit. But like the thing is, like we actually need infrastructure at this point. We need energy infrastructure, and they're just they're just stopping everything with without any kind of alternative. That's what it seems like the environmental movement is to me. It's just stopping anything and everything from happening. Well, they also they really do see it as a like an ideological battle, right? Um, and that they need to beat the ideology of growth. And then, so it makes perfect sense that they want to create memes. And, but, but it also shows it's like a very idealist program. That's like, like the problem with our society is this, you know, ideological fixation on growth as if that's the problem and not the fact that a small minority of people control all the wealth and property and production. The people who are 
invested in all this stuff, they don't care that they have to pay more for it. It actually, I think it makes them feel a little better that they have to pay more for it. I think that the, the whole the whole movement is like this kind of like consumer first movement where, you know, people can think of themselves, their agency comes from their consumer activity. And so by, you know, buying this more, you know, high end expensive green energy or so their soul, you know, what they're what they're told it is, uh, they feel like they're doing their part. They never have to worry about it running out or whatever. There's like so much money and so much conditioning that's leading everyone to believe that fighting climate change is an individual act. You know, if you go to Home Depot and you see the table in front where they're like selling the, the solar panel installations, people believe more in that and that's more tangible to them than the idea that there's some plant 60 miles away that's um, humming along and providing their energy. That's like, you know, it's it's something, it, it's meaningless. Like I turn on my, my light switch and the light comes on and it's like the Home Depot table where they're, they're doing the solar panel installations. Is, that's the thing that's presented to me as like, oh, you're going to save the world by doing this. They might see it too as like kind of like a tax on cigarettes. It's like people need the price discipline to, uh, to start using less energy. And, you know, and, and another motivation too is kind of this accelerationism where it's like maybe people aren't literally thinking like, oh, costs go up and it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase the pressure and things are going to deteriorate faster and there's more opportunity for my ideology to take hold. But I, I do think there's a kind of nihilism or, or something where people don't care. People just assume like, oh yeah, well, the, the price will go up and people will like organize and be forced to do something about it, be forced into action. And I think some powerful people definitely have like a apocalyptic ideation where they think that, you know, it's all, it's all inevitable that things are going to come to a head. And whenever it happens, it happens. There's not that kind of love of the people as they are now. Kind of forecloses on the idea of, of a mass politics. They see that the only people that need to be convinced of it are elites and people that are in control of the resources. And then everyone else, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the working class thinks about it because it's something that will be imposed on them, which is why I, f I find it to be a kind of compatible with like you know, some people call it the Great Reset or, you know, the, what you hear at the World Economic Forum is that the people that run the world are doing degrowth. They're doing a version of it where, you know, we're, we're all they they believe that someday we'll all own nothing and that everything will be a subscription service. Everything will be delivered to us. That's the tragic thing is that people are going to have to die. Like we're on this road where it's like we can see a disaster coming. It's like what happens when we, you know, we hit some kind of tipping point and the weather conditions are not that great and the backup sources aren't able to do enough in time. And we, we get to this point where there's a disaster and like the dialysis machines turn off, you know what I mean? I mean, you want your hospital running 24 seven. It's like, like you, you can't get cute with like the efficiency, like at least not if you're, you know, if it's like you in the hospital, you know, like you don't, I mean, if you're a Malthusian, like, he, there's some gray area here. I don't know if Marx ever personally interacted with him, but he did write the book Theories of Surplus Value, which was Marx's critique of various economists who had come before him, including Adam Smith, including, you know, other folks. And he specifically has a section in that book about Malthus. Um, and he basically argues that Malthusian economics uh, is, is basically, it's a shill, that the guy was paid by various people to write economic arguments to justify what they were doing. He wrote a book basically justifying predatory landlords who, who were charging people rent that they couldn't afford. And he wrote a book arguing that that was somehow justified. And his, his book where he coins the term overpopulation, right, the essay on the principle of population, um, that that was largely, what that was about was it was an attack on the French Revolution. Right. That across the channel, you know, the British were looking at the French Revolution and saying, oh, my goodness, what's going on there? Why did this happen? Well, Marx understood that this was feudalism in France was no longer sustainable. It was, you know, a new social order coming into being. Um, but of course, the British Empire didn't see it that way. And so they argued, oh, these French people were just breeding too much and the, uh, the food supply didn't catch up with the birth rate. So therefore, you know, therefore, uh, you know, we, we just, you know, we, when the poor people have too many children, every so often you have a big explosion of violence and that's, that's all you can do about it. 
Um, but there's there's some other parallels because you know neo Malthusianism. It's about a hundred years later uh, you get the rise. You know the Rockefeller family, right? That's the you know you know John D. Rockefeller, the founder of, founder of Standard Oil, is like the richest American who's ever lived. He's richer than most billionaires are in our time if you add you know relative wealth. I mean he was the richest American in history. Um, you know and he started a similar idea because there's strikes and labor unions and all these things. What can it be? What well, can't be that our system's bad? What well, must be that the poor people just breed too much? He starts the neo Malthusian society. Uh, and, and he gets a lot of British intellectuals on board with him. And eventually they find an, an, a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Um, and Margaret Sanger was a communist in New York City, but she was one of these cosmopolitan intellectuals who wasn't into communism so much for the workers' rights as she was into it because communism meant free love. She was all about free love and sex and, you know, and all that. She heroically went to jail for birth control many times. She didn't like John D. Rockefeller because he was a big capitalist and she was a communist. So she actually took out an ad in one of her newspapers calling for his assassination and then fled the country. Uh, but when she was in exile, she went to the Soviet Union and she got to the Soviet Union and she didn't like it because the Soviet Union wasn't the free love, free sex paradise she was hoping for. And, you know, in the Soviet Union, it was under attack and invaded and it became a rather rigid, militarized place where they weren't, you know, having big wild sex parties all the time. So she didn't like the Soviet Union. She went back to Britain and she actually made up with John D. Rockefeller, abandoned communism, moved back to the United States and became a leader of the Malthusian Society of the United States and founded Planned Parenthood. Um, and what's disturbing is, um, you know, she wrote a book called The Cruelty of Charity and it was written during the Great Depression. And on the cover, it has like a girl like holding a bowl, like begging, right? Now you look at that, any rational person sees that girl begging, they say, give her some food, right? But a certain mindset says, oh, that girl should never have been created. And this is what happens when the poor people breed. And she goes around speaking to Ku Klux Klan rallies and you know, saying that you know, if we legalize birth control and abortion, we can breed out the black race. And she's making, you know, she's making, she's gone from communism to Malthusianism. Marxists are not opposed to wealth. And that that idea is widespread among the population. You, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, there's this notion that, uh, that communists were opposed to wealth and capitalism is a system where people have wealth. And then on that basis, you have a lot of working class people who say, well, I'd like to have wealth. So I'm a capitalist and all these people, you know, in Venezuela, look, they're poorer than the United States. So that clearly that's communism because they're poorer or something. That's, that's the mass, you know, belief, right? But the reality is that, you know, communists, socialists, they're not opposed to wealth. They are opposed to wealth being created through exploitation. They are opposed to a system where the means of production operate according to profits. And the problem with the billionaires that rule our world, the problem with them isn't that they have wealth. The problem is that their wealth was acquired in a system where profits come before people. And the hope is that, you know, with socialism, the banks and the factories, the major industries can be publicly owned and operated rationally. So growth can go to even higher levels than what we see in this society. So when you say abolish billionaires, billionaire is just a measurement of wealth, right? When you say abolish capitalists, sure. Abolish capitalism, I'm on board with you. When you say abolish billionaires, you're saying we're going to cap human wealth at a certain level. And that reinforces this notion that we're anti-wealth, which we aren't. And second of all, it's a pessimistic view. It, it takes away the ultimate vision of a of, of vast abundance breaking down all inequality, right? And this requires an understanding of Marxism. Back in the time of, of feudalism, a, a mirror was a very, very valuable item that only like the richest kings and queens had, right? So if you had been around back then and you declared abolish mirrors, that wouldn't have been the right approach. I would say, let's do a higher mode of production so everyone can have a mirror like we have now. You know what I'm saying? Like, and if you say abolish billionaires, you're, you're saying no one in in all of the rest of human history should ever have what a billionaire has now. And you're, you're, you're basically declaring it's a pessimistic outlook, right? Um, and it also reinforces anti-communist uh, delusions, right? People just don't understand the nature of, of Marxism.
So part of what how the left changes is just about the circumstances, but you have to then add to that conscious manipulation, right? Which is also a factor because starting in 1949, the CIA launched a program called the Congress for Cultural Freedom and started funneling money to anti-communist leftists. Generally, the people that made up the Congress for Cultural Freedom were followers of the Trotskyite Max Schachtman. And Schachtman, uh, after World War II, his followers, uh, one of them being Irving Kristol, who is the father of neoconservatism, started working for the CIA. And Irving Kristol was actually the director of the CIA's Congress for Cultural Freedom program, where they started covertly giving money to leftists uh, in order to put out an anti-Soviet uh, message. Um, and uh, the magazine Partisan Review, which was a purported to be a communist socialist magazine, and it was all over the college campuses. Every campus you went to, you could find a partisan review. And it was this subversive communist magazine, except it, it like every issue was devoted to exposing the Stalinists, uh, you know, much like in the way, you know, people get gone after now. They would wage campaigns against one artist or intellectual who was aligned with the communists and get people to boycott their performances. And, and uh, a lot of the, you know, what was done in partisan review magazine was equating the Soviets with the Nazis, right? And saying that, that it's basically the same system and direct CIA payments to, to pay for their operations were supplemented by uh, the Ford Foundation and uh, the Rockefeller think tanks and other things. And various left-wing academics were getting subsidized by getting paid lots of money to have their articles appear in this magazine that was everywhere. And this was the conscious manipulation. And uh, you talk about the Frankfurt School and, and the rise of, of this new, and it's weird because on the right, they have this whole thing about cultural Marxism. Right. Well, well, what they're missing is that a lot of these like cultural critics that really emphasize Gramsci really downplayed the idea of class struggle, uh, you know, you know, emphasized, uh, you know, you had Herbert Marcuse, who said that the working class was not revolutionary, the intellectuals were the revolutionaries. All of this was being covertly supported as a way to kind of direct intellectuals and leftists away from Marxism. And in the process, they changed really the nature of what leftism was, you know, the anti-populism came out. Susan Sontag is a really important voice in this milieu. And, and so Hannah Arendt also comes out of this. Um, and anti-populism, the idea that average people are the enemy, that average people are dangerous, and if they ever get together and start fighting for their rights, uh, that's that's basically the same as Nazi Germany. That became a big theme in what it meant to be a leftist, this kind of intellectual nonconformity. You know, that's not the class struggle on the, on the planet. It's not between territories or countries, it's between classes. And there's actually a lot of rich people in the global south too that are doing great. And, um, and you know, obviously the global north has got more rich people, I'll, I'll give them that, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's just, and I, I recently saw him tweet out something about how you know, the industrialization has moved to the global south and, and actually it's the rich countries that appropriate the value from the workers in the global south. And I was like, wait a minute, it's not the countries that do that, it's the capitalists who employ those workers in the factory. Come on, it's Marx. And, and it's 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 unbelievable that like suddenly like the villain in this frame of thinking has become whole countries, like the rich countries are now our target. Like that's what we need to get to to degrow and how we need to but like those are unequal entities but it's, it's amazing you know the big thing that the whole climate movement kind of coalesced around this idea that um okay you, you know first of all we want biden to you know this is before he was elected they're trying to shape the biden climate plan and they wanted it to be this many trillion. It was all about how many trillion it is, and that's what really counts. But then the other thing was that they wanted 40% of the of the two trillion or whatever it turned out to be to to go to the frontline communities, right? And that became like the most important thing. And, and no one seemed to bring up that that's exactly that is means testing. That means you have to determine who is a frontline community. You have to then <laughs> Biden actually put it into his plan. He was going to set up what's something called the environmental justice screening tool to, to actually determine which communities are disadvantaged enough to get the, the investment. And this is, you know, the kinds of policies that create divisions within the working class. They create resentments. They create all this kind of. Um... 
Jimmy Carter, you know, that was really the first Democratic president we had who was from this like new left degrowth, you know, mentality. And it was kind of a turning point. And, um, you know, Jimmy Carter, he published, you know, documents from the White House that, that pushed the idea that there is, you know, you know, growth is bad, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're you know, can't have growth because it's bad for Mother Nature, it's going to destroy the environment. Uh, he pushed identity politics. He, he sponsored the, an international women's, you know, or a national women's convention, right, in Texas, where, you know, women's groups wrote the women's agenda. But what's interesting is he also launched a purge of his own party with the FBI. He launched a program called Abscam. Uh, which stood for Arab scam. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie American Hustle, but it's a fictionalized account of this. Um, but the members of Congress who were targeted were a layer that they called the labor Democrats. And they were guys that were tied to the Teamsters Union and tied to the, the labor unions, the maritime unions and stuff. And they were guys that tended to be not from his degrowth school. They tended to be pro-nuclear power, generally. Uh, they tended to be tied to organized labor. Uh, they tended to be really into you know, government spending on infrastructure. And, you know, the FBI had this guy dress up like an Arab and try to give them money. And in some cases, uh, the, the members of Congress, the senators and others who were being framed would push the, the suitcase away and say, I don't want to take your bribe. And it didn't matter. They would be convicted. And it was just a purge uh, that was carried out, um, you know, and it was a way to purge the Democratic Party of these, you know, you used to have in urban areas generally, you had entrenched, you know, members of Congress who often were very corrupt and maybe tied in with the mafia or something, but also were very, very into handing out the goods. You know what I'm saying? And that's what had to be gotten rid of. Um, and so as the the more Rockefeller, Malthusian, you know, degrowth, synthetic left element came in, you had to push back the power of organized labor. You had to get rid of the influence of the Teamsters and people like that. I think what people need to understand is that a lot of these unions are really demoralized. A lot of them are hostile to the left because their experience of the left is the environmental movement. The fact that all over the world, there's gonna be this huge, huge communist gathering for the 100th anniversary of Lenin's birth, right? And there's a huge radical movement in the United States of people that are in the streets and, you know, when we, communist factions are gaining influence in the United States. If you look at what Earth Day was, Earth Day was not a communist gathering by any means. It was very much a gathering that was about we need to regulate industry to some degree in order to, to curb pollution. But it also pushed forward some of the elements of the environmental movement that, that were probably the most contrary to Marxism. Right. Because a lot of, you know, Marxism is an ideology. It's about growth fundamentally. The goal is banks, factories and industries, you know, the means of production rationally controlled by society, getting rid of the irrational boom bust cycle and moving to a world of so much material abundance that class differences break down. Um, but a lot of the hippie movement kind of had the opposite in their aesthetics. They, they admired the primitivism of the East. Uh, they, they kind of talked about growth being bad. Um, and so you had a holiday that kind of highlighted that aspect of leftism, which was very contrary to the Marxist kind of thing. Just the sense of like people who were not strictly living paycheck to paycheck without a sense of control over their own destiny. They have some capital, they have some land, they have some networks, something that gives them a sense of power. And therefore, the space to think about systems and the kind of system that matches how they would approach the world. And I think I can see, I mean, Fox, you mentioned, you know, the, the decline of the new left. I mean, there's something to that, right? Like the, the, the collapse of mass movements. So, you know, you always have, when the economy is good, when the economy is bad, no matter what state society is in, you're gonna have a layer of uh, what you might call the revolutionary intelligentsia. College professors, intellectuals, you know, people that are interested in communist politics, not because they're starving and hungry, but just out of, you know, they, they do want a better society. They see the injustices of the world. And, and with, you know, in some cases you can argue it's a privileged position that they have access to information and education and opportunities other people don't have, and that opens their eyes. So this kind of, this milieu of, you know, kind of middle-class academic folks became really the only place communists could really recruit uh, and really have influence. So, you know, you see, especially, you know, as the Vietnam War gets going, there's a big focus on pacifism, right? It's an appeal to pacifism. The 
folks who are trying to stop the Vietnam War, they're not saying, you know, workers turn your guns around. Instead, they're saying, you know, we're focusing on pacifism. The Soviet Union is emphasizing the danger of nuclear war. And the Communist Party USA, their orientation is more to try and appeal to Catholic clergy and ministers and push for kind of pacifism. That because of the booming U.S. economy, class struggle wasn't a thing, right? In the black community, you had anger and, and resistance to Jim Crow. Um, and among intellectuals and academics, you had, you know, opposition to, to the status quo. And then you had, you know, kind of pacifistic opposition to the Vietnam War. But overall, the class struggle, the, you know, the desperation you had in the 30s was gone. Also sort of bought into this kind of post-World War II kind of like, you know, middle class dream or whatever. Like you're going to, you're going to get a car and a house and you're going to, consume in this kind of very private way <laughs> um have these kind of forms of what i call like privatized provisioning where you're kind of like living in these little atomized suburban spaces and so the that kind of experience of the class professional class professional managerial class living in the suburbs living these kind of mass consumption lifestyles for many of them led to a kind of simultaneous anxiety about about the ecological crisis and feeling like, oh my God, like I'm participating in the ecological crisis. And, and because this class is prone to a kind of a narcissism, <laughs> I think, they, they also concluded that they themselves were the cause of the ecological crisis, which is totally wrong. It's, it's capital, it's the cause, like it's not these petty bourgeois people in the suburbs. And so that they, they, they created this this politics that was all about less, right? A politics of less, like scaling down and consuming less and small and beautiful. And, and that really resonated with this class, right? And this class itself was just fundamentally separate from material production. It's that separation which made them anxious. And I think a lot of their politics is also like, like sort of doing this weird, like we're gonna like study <laughs> what production is and we're going to discover through again this commodity chain analysis or life cycle analysis we're going to like discover the truth of production and find that it's it has all these problems and there's all these costs and they, it, it leads to all these you know again this pollution for frontline communities and so most of their experience of production was studying it and learning about it and knowing it and then and then reprimanding it as like environmentally bad But one of the things that's happened is that we have created an incredibly wealthy society in America that was very industrially powerful for a long period of time. And we offshored a lot of that. And I think part of what happens, along with some other things playing a role in this, is that we basically like forget or don't understand the way shit works, right? Like the plant isn't something that you grow up with integrated in your life in like Michigan. Like my mom's dad who I never got to meet and he died when she was she was young but he had an eighth grade education came back from world war ii worked on the gm line worked his way up to management my grandma peg his wife never had to work and he raised four kids you see what i'm saying but that meant that these this company my mom's eighth grade education that part of the science unit was the internal combustion engine right because detroit was the motor city and so I think we've, it's easy to forget because we're Americans and we're quite good at forgetting um, what you lose when you lose these things, right? So another way that I think about it is like this. I think we tend to do more than we know that we're doing. So when you lose an ability, you lose more than you recognize. And it takes a long time for some of those results to show up. And if you're wealthy, like the United States is wealthy, despite its inequalities, it means you've got an enormous margin for error with these sorts of things. That's why you can get away with fragilizing the grid to all get out. And nobody's asking too many questions until it gets really bad because it takes a long time for anyone to really feel that. And not just anyone, but to people who are empowered and have a stake. In other words, to like bourgeois and up. You know, this country is very willing to let the poor and working class suffer whatever it is. And because they're atomized, disorganized and often demoralized, they take it through, honestly, like no fault of their own in a lot of ways. When you look at a lot of the literature and the evergreen stuff, it's all about what they call justice-centered uh, approach. And they talk about economic inclusion and they talk about fairness and equity and these buzzwords, which I argue are more, again, about the kind of moral signaling to within professional class NGO milieus 
than actually even engaging with these. So, so the whole thing that they're interested in is is really centering. That's a word. That, <laughs> centering the the kind of most marginalized um, communities and what are often climate climate space. That they use the word space like this. So in the space, they they like to say frontline communities, right? The the ones that are most impacted by the fossil fuel infrastructure, the, the climate, and also climate change impacts are disproportionate. So this kind of language really is about like these marginalized communities that are kind of left behind by the system. And the whole idea of economic inclusion sort of assumes the majority are kind of doing fine in the normal economy. We just need to kind of include um, these, these left behind uh, marginalized folks. Like what they're talking about are some of the most impoverished and environmentally um, damaged communities. And, and, and obviously we want to improve the lives of, of these communities. But, you know, to do so, you actually need to build the kind of power that could actually confront the, the corporations that are actually poisoning those frontline communities or those environmental justice communities. And my argument is that to do so, you actually do have to speak to a broader um, coalition, a broader mass uh, working, a working class kind of politics. And again, it doesn't seem like they're even trying to do that. They're 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 talking more about um, kind of uh, this sort of minoritarian inclusion. No, and in, in, in the PMC space, um, you know, the, it's a language of privilege, right? Like everyone's sort of the masses of people have this sort of privilege, right? And, and, and need to shed that privilege. And, and but it's these, these really marginalized folks that are, you know, that we really need to center and bring to the include and all this kind of language. But, but um, I think that frame of mind kind of assumes that really it's the masses that we're part of, that we're all kind of privileged in our massiveness and our sort of ordinary consumer lives that are kind of like boring and whatever. And, um, you know, that's just not accurate. You know, the masses of people are struggling and, and they, need, um, uh, they need economic inclusion, but they don't want it to sound like that. They need sort of like broad, again, universal public goods that kind of um, would actually reach masses of people. I think what maybe new communitarianism came about that out of my shock that some of the, the founders of localist ideology, a localist theory, were not leftists. I had in my naivety assumed that all the people that were, um, you know, preaching localism were, you know, pretty much like me, but misguided. <laughs> as arrogant as that sounds. So it's like, yeah, yeah, we we wanna we wanna create a new society and, and smash the state and, and build up workers' democracy. But you know, maybe maybe we just have a different way of doing it. And then reading like some of the vicious anti-communism uh, sentiments of some of the people that I, I quote in the book and the sheer bloody minded privilege of, of someone like King Solver, who, who's, I, I think I hate read that book, um, her um, Animal Vegetable Miracle. Uh, it, it really dawned on me. It's like, well, no, these people are not on our side. Well, these are not on my side. They seem to be on their own side. And then they're forming communities that they claim I'm supposed to be a part of, and there's something wrong with me if I don't want to be. I mean, this this is this goes beyond sheer misguidedness. I started to see it as someone really malign and, and almost malevolent. And neo-communitarianism, I mean, it had, to me, it kind of captures that sense of like, no, we are our own kind of community of homogenous, let's face it, homogenous classes. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, quite willing to use and abuse other people to get what we want, which is, a, I guess, a sense of well-being. Of course, I, I would have to uh, go back and do a commodity chain analysis of, of potatoes, but I mean, just as a thought experiment, like, what about the, the pots, the water, 
to, to what we're seeing you having mashed potatoes, the tools, um, the uh, the kitchens, the maintenance, the, the the roads to transport those potatoes, the uh, the, the bicycle parts, um, the uh, the in shapeness of the courier, <laughs> like there's just so many things that spread immediately beyond the local. And one of the, I think the, the, the facileness of that's a word of localist analysis is it just exists reflecting its petty bourgeois background, it exists as consumer buying things from the merchant. That's the only concept of local. But this is, this is the only kind of site that the petty bourgeois sees. First of all, it's such a limited prospect. It's, it's, it's imaginatively like sterile to think that this tiny segment of wealthy people who cares about that stuff, who achieves their kind of, again, using Bourdieu's term, habitus, their, their sense of identity and separateness from everyone else, who achieves that through local markets versus, I don't know, the international club circuit, racing vintage cars, I mean, you name it, right? There's so many other things that rich people can do with their money. So you already have this narrow segment of people who care about this stuff. And then, as you say, it depends totally on this narrow segment having the resources to do it. So it cuts out another 95% of people. So, and if it was just a hobby for the rich, I'd have no problem with it, to be honest, because like, whatever, I mean, rich people do crazy stuff. That's what they got the money for. Uh, but it's when it becomes, and maybe this is the liberalism that you're talking about, when it becomes a strategy for the left, that's when I object. I'm like, okay, do your shit, but don't try to tell me it's going to change the world because it's not. And the problem with the localism, I think, is it, is it, it foreshortens this. It says, you know, no, no, forget all that. Here's the method. We have the answer. Act in your morally appropriate way, Alice Schumacher, and here is your new world. And, you know, as you've seen, like it fails at the first hurdle, so. Yeah, because here, like here in Kingston, like you know, we are we are the I, I believe we are the preeminent uh, degrowth slash localism experiment in the entire world in this town, and all it has brought is just hyper gentrification and a utopian lifestyle for the upper middle class and above. The working class people that were here uh, either you know are alienated and not included in this whole thing, or they're gone. Uh, and we're and they but they built something, you know. Some of them were like coerced or tricked or some, into like volunteering and building something that now, you know, well-resourced people are coming in and enjoying. Um, I, I do not see a movement building. I see us attracting, <laughs> attracting people to move into really nice real estate, but I, I don't see it. Kingston at all times is like a classroom a workplace, uh, an experiment, you know, it, it's like all these things at once. It's like a, a it's a fishbowl, you know, for, for all these people that are poking and prodding it in the hopes that it's going to be this inspiring example to the rest of the world. Or indeed finding new ways to uh, fix capital for the uh, comfortably afflicted. The resources, the earth you have to move to get the resources to make the batteries to back up renewables and stuff like that is something sometimes 10 to 100 to 1. So we're talking about like millions of tons of earth moved to get batteries that don't work all the time. And these people are localists too. So like they don't care. They're localists. You know, once the solar panel magically appears in my local utopia, then it's all local and it's all about being in a right relationship with the earth. But, you know, if you look at, like you said, the supply chain, you know, it's coming from a lithium mine. So I, I got into it, I, I sort of was interested in this kind of very romantic idea of the local, but then for whatever reason, I got kind of fascinated by oil and energy. And, and I started thinking, really, I started reading a lot more Marx and Marxism. And I started thinking about like, how do we think about the historical era of fossil fuels as kind of specific to this kind of industrial regime of capitalism. And once I started looking to that, I started reading a lot of history and I started realizing, you know, the before 
before the kind of industrial revolution for fossil fuels, it was a lot of localism. <laughs> it's a lot of local and agrarian economies and that the main thing I kind of fixated on was that I realized like, oh, um, you know, 80 to 85% of energy use in pre-industrial times was muscle power. It was like hard labor and like what fossil fuels and industrialism really did was kind of uh, create this new era of automatic machinery that it all got channeled into capital accumulation. So that's not good, but it did kind of liberate society to a, a, a limited extent from this kind of very drudgery based agrarian type of thing. Um, but then the more I, I studied it, um, you, you find in the history of oil, like the real problem in the oil market is not scarcity or not too little oil, it's it's abundant. It's too much oil that, that it overproduction and glut that kind of leads to price collapses. And so you start to study the history of oil, oil and you see there's been all these mechanisms and institutions that have been set up to manage production of oil to keep it limited, to get them to stop producing so much oil so that they cannot overproduce the market and collapse prices. It started actually in Texas where they literally had to call in the National Guard to get people to stop producing oil because they, they discovered the biggest oil field in the Great Depression. And they, and they set up something called the Texas Railroad Commission, all these things to kind of limit how much oil was produced. And then that was what inspired OPEC to to form as this kind of bunch of countries that got together to try to limit each other's oil output. And again, it's not just oil. You look at food commodities, you look at any natural resources, and the problem under capitalism is abundance. It's too much stuff. It gets overproduced, the market crashes. I've always just maintained the answer is we need to move beyond fossil fuels. We need fusion energy. You know, we hire energy sources. Um, and that, you know, historical progress is not bad. And whenever you start saying that growth is bad, economic development is bad, uh, you know, it's the, I think Mother Teresa, you know, notoriously reactionary said, poverty is beautiful. That kind of mind is dangerous. It's dangerous. And that's not, you can't be a progressive and think that way. Was this the, the, you know, was localism to be the end result of all the incredible organizing coming out of the global justice movement, the anti-war movement that people gave so much of their time for? I mean, if that's the case, that's, that's quite a depressing statement. Something I think current that's going on that makes me think about it is uh, what's happening in Texas right now that, uh, you know, many people are sucked into the the culture war of like oh i i like these small is beautiful kind of uh decentralized grids that um you know everyone should have solar panels on their house it's just a culture war like mirroring of what libertarians are saying they're like you know a mayor of one town in texas was like everyone should have their own generator everyone you know we shouldn't be relying on like anybody to provide power for us and it's like uh, small as beautiful leftists and libertarians are like coming to the same conclusion. What's so scary about this idea of localism as the solution from a leftist perspective is that it has to be so precise in its execution. It has to have these perfect conditions. Otherwise, it turns right into like eco-fascism or libertarianism or whatever, you know, it, it it like needs the perfect conditions to exist. And it's it, which is why it's uto it's utopian. And it's like, why are we saying like, let's we're trying to achieve something where it, it has to go just right. Otherwise, it'll go terribly wrong. Like, why are we saying that that's a good idea? Uh, over time, I've sort of developed what I call my decline maxim. Like, when do you know society is in decline? And I think one of the things you could say is that um, it's when the immediate financial interests of the elite start to undermine the material foundations of their status. That's what's happening in Texas right now, right? So Amazon's real business isn't making sure that you get your shady sneakers on time, right? That's not really where they make their money. They make their money by doing lots of computing stuff for the Department of Defense. That is energy intensive work. I mean, so is basically their whole logistics chain. So I guess we can add that too. Why not? We'll do it all. All right, so Texas had those blackouts 
over February, right? And part of what happened there is a cold snap hit and the grid was fragile because they had spent like billions of dollars on all of this wind, which barely worked and all the solar, which didn't work at all. And then they had all of this natural gas, which delivers just in time, but can get frozen in the pipeline and also experience pipe crowding. So when demand moved beyond their energy supply and the way the auction houses work for the grid in an ISO like Texas means that no one is allowed to keep fuel on hand because that would make it unfair in the market. It meant that those blackouts happened. Now, the Texas legislature has learned from this and they're saying, okay, we want to start canceling these renewable projects or they have to start guaranteeing their own natural gas backups. Who's there against them? Well, it's Jeff Bezos, it's Apple. It's all of these groups that have a stake in these renewable things that are actively fragilizing the material infrastructure upon which their own elite status relies. Once you get into that cycle, it is very hard to break out. I like when I think of things that trouble me the most, it's not like sea levels rising or whatever. It's things like that. Well, I don't think that the world is going to end. I think capitalism is going to end. And it makes sense that they have such a fatalist outlook because their system is ultimately doomed. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think humans will continue to grow and expand without the greed of billionaires and bankers. The challenge is, of course, like what goes inside it. But but I think like the the idea of like radically upping like production is the right way to think about it. I mean, especially, you know, if you're coming, you know, as a Marxist and you see the, the production process as sort of like the canvas on which social relations and society is organized. I mean, starting with production, what you're going to produce, I think, is a good is a good start. It's just two two really simple questions. And the first one is the technical question. How does this work? And then the second one is like the oldest political question in the world. Cui bono? Who benefits? And then from there, you can start to like cobble certain things together. So a really great example is um, you can see those like BP ads for like um, wind that have like windmills and stuff like that, you know, like wind turbines and like solar, you know, and it's just like, oh, like, are we really winning like environmental victories here? Like even BP is like taking ads out. And the reason they're doing that is because the way that the grid is structured in America is that for however like X amount of renewables, right? weather dependent renewables, so not hydro, weather dependent renewables, that's wind and solar, you build out, you're gonna need Y percentage more of backup. So what's that gonna be? That's gonna be natural gas or nuclear. But natural gas, we have path dependency for, which means we're really good at making it very cheaply and it's resilient. So BP is taking a look at these renewable build outs and they're like, shit, we're always gonna be in business the more people build these things out. Like, this is great for us. We love environmentalism. And like, I'm not like against solar power. I mean, for all, I mean, it seems like a great way to like power a city like Las Vegas, you know? I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know, I even understand how that would work in, in New York City where you have like buildings in the shade. And CUNY did this study about how half the city's power needs could be met by putting like solar panels on like all the buildings in New York City. And it's like, that is not the sort of like suburban environmentalist, like it's not the, you know, it's, I mean, think of like the New York City real estate market is worth like trillions of dollars. Like that's um, like, how are you going to pull off that like massive seizure of property where you, where you would force every building owner to put a solar panel on there? And then the other question is, is, do people want that? People like going on their roofs. And imagine like the, the amount of, imagine having that much political power to like also deal with all the neighborhood associations and all the like historical pre preservation people. Imagine having that amount of political power, thinking they could pull that off, but, but you, choosing to do this very like individualistic solution that doesn't work on a cloudy day. I'm not for the, the pipeline being built in North Brooklyn, but it's like when you get rid of nuclear, like it, it, this was always inevitable. Every 
reliability study on the closure of Indian Point, whether that was commissioned by Riverkeeper, whether it was by uh, NISO. Every, every reliability assessment said you're going to have to have natural gas to replace nuclear. Like, for instance, like the, you know, the amount of, of, of power that Indian Point gave to New York City, and that was like a quarter. I mean, you need, you need like the, the land mass of, of wind farms that you need is like size of like New York City. Like, like, the, like that's a lot of like political battles. I mean, and in addition to that, you have, you know, you need like this, the natural gas. It's like they're like totally oblivious to the fact that you need to have a, like a baseload source, you know. You know, for every, you know, X amount of like renewable that, you know, that you produce. This indigenous rights activist, Stephen Corey, he correctly pointed out that like this idea of the pure wilderness that must be conserved, like like that too is is like a racist construct. It's it's based off this assumption that for the thousands of years that indigenous people lived on their land, like that they weren't modifying and they just like lived merrily and at one with, you know, nature before the settlers or whatever, you know, came along. It's so funny cuz like that's the the Champlain Hudson Power Express. So when like Riverkeeper was advocating for the closure, like there there was always like the issue of the replacement for Indian Point. And they were always comfortable with gas, but in their reliability assessment ahead of the 2017 closure, they pointed to this transmission line from Quebec, which would sell power into New York City. Then after the closure is announced, suddenly they're against it. They they said the indigenous people don't want this. And but you know, that actually wasn't true. So this deal was, has been sort of done by the city. To, to de Blasio's credit, he sent like his team to Canada to be open with the indigenous groups there on the process. They had actually asked this coalition of environmental groups like Riverkeeper and, and the Sierra Club to like stop using their name. But back then, like they basically pointed to this group that was in like Newfoundland, which is like hundreds of miles away from Quebec where the uh, the dams are. I mean, Hydro-Quebec said, we're not building any more dams. Like, it, it was sort of just like a reflexive opposition to the, I mean, the actual reason, the actual reason why the the environmental movement in New York has been against this is because the, the association of renewable developers, like, th they've been very straightforward that they're like, well, if all this power is going to be cleared up, on, like we want our developers to take up, you know, to make up that supply of, like, why should it come from out of state when it can come from in state? And you know, of course, there's a lot of overlap between the renewable developers and the the NGOs. So it's it, it, like the and the arguments are like, you know, like back to the fish, like this, it hurts the fishing in indigenous communities or. But it's just, I mean, it, it's just, so, it's used in such, such a tokenized way. I mean, again, like the, that opposition in Quebec didn't even exist while they were first making these arguments. You know, like again, and, and like Riverkeeper just totally flip-flopped on it because they supported it at first when they needed to get rid of it. I mean, and they don't care because at the end of the day, like Alec Baldwin will always be able to get power into his like Westchester home. The situation that happened during the Cold War with the uranium mining for nuclear weapons in New Mexico, where I used to live, I love New Mexico. The experience that happened to the Navajo there was a travesty and there should absolutely be material reparations there. Full stop. That situation needs to be fixed. And it also needs to be fixed for frankly a more cynical reason is that people love to beat up the civilian nuclear energy industry for that. But here's what I'll tell you. like if. If you want to say like, you know, climate justice, usually that means like somebody will say the word indigenous a few times and then like bring up all the, you know, different groups that they're going to help. Things aren't so clear. If you go to Ocotillo, California, there are tribes there that have been fighting the renewables build out because it takes up tons of land. The same thing is happening in the Mojave right now. It's going over tribal land. You basically have to scrape that shit clean to put the solar in. If you go north of the border into Saskatchewan, there is a huge trade union that is largely Navajo that are uranium miners that are figuring out how to sue the United States government for shuttering its nuclear plants because it's fucking up their bottom line. 
right? So like, what do we mean by reparations, by justice or whatever? These are all terms that obscure more than they clarify. And I get it. People want to live in a better world. Things seem painful right now. A lot of people suffer and it's unclear how to make it better. I think that's where a lot of stuff is coming from. I think a lot of its appeal is there. And I think that there are actually a lot of true believers attached to this that don't know any better. And then I also think that there are tons of cynical operators as well. And, and they also talk about like indigenous sovereignty. And the thing is like you can't, if, if we're going to build out all these intermittent renewables, then indigenous people are going to be in battles to block this stuff from being built because it's going to take up an insane amount of land and it's it's going to be their land and you know that's not sovereignty like that's that's something else this is how it works out perfectly because they want to degrow everything and they want to do land this is why they want to do land back i've just figured it out this is why they want to do land back because land back is a very convenient way to say no. We're, you know, all they need to do is find like an indigenous NGO person and say no, give it back to me, and then you basically like you're seizing land under the name of like doing it for indigenous reparations or whatever. That's what it seems like to me. Is like the whole land back thing is just a way to seize land and do it in like a woke, <laughs> like racial kind of like way and for wind and solar it's like almost the land mass of ohio and to generate the terawatt hours needed for the entire grid in nuclear it's smaller than the city of chicago and they were like don't you know we can farm under you know uh wind turbines and stuff like that that's what they came at with me with like the, the wind thing is totally off and i was just like what forever like for all of the wind turbines you're gonna need for the entire grid like you're gonna be able to farm under that also like no one wants that i've, I've learned this over the years i talked with people who are anti-wind activists for a very long time they had very interesting things to say they live in flyover country and they have to deal with this shit, and they are farmers you know, and stuff like that, because that's where that stuff gets built. And why does it get built there? Well, one, because that's where the land is. But two, most importantly, it's away from like the urban hubs where these people who are deciding these things actually live. So it destroys quality of life there. By the way, I would encourage anybody to look into the rules for how the wind industry has to report killing endangered species. Like it is totally captured by the industry completely captured by there's no way you can put dozens of big metal fans in the sky and it is not slaughtering the shit out of birds the closer you live to these things the more you hate them the farther away you live the more you like them and the opposite is true for nuclear right so if you go to illinois where the ibew is very militant about keeping byron and dresden alive there right those nuclear plants those people understand what nuclear does it brings in first of all you can work your way up in nuclear it's very hard to find that anymore two it creates an ecosystem of unions so good labor jobs that can be handed down generation after generation right so it's not just ibew and these larger things it's like local pipe fitters 101 you know or like whatever like those guys are there too because the plant needs them and so it raises the standard of living there I don't think that there has been a single community where they have put a ton of turbines or whatever, where that has happened, where it has raised the standard of living. Let's get back to the topic. What's what's going on with, uh, with the Bill Gates and all that? Well, a lot of it is the small is beautiful ideology. Like people are worried about big state enterprises. They have this idea that we can have like this snap together world where you like build each of the parts separately and then you bring them over to the site and then you snap them together. I mean, look, I don't want, <laughs> just look at how that that's worked out for Boeing where they've had like different contracted engineering teams show up with wings that don't fit on the plane because they were expecting it all to snap together at the very end. like. It's not, first of all, we don't have the technology now. Second of all, it's, I think, built on shaky premises from what I can tell as a layman. And three, the solution isn't like a technical problem. We have it. It's the political will, institution, and infrastructure that we need to achieve something like a nuclear new deal, to decarbonize and to defragilize the grid. 
We want safe bets here when we're dealing with this stuff. We don't want to pray to Silicon Valley for rain. We've got generation three reactors that work well and they work now, right? That's what we want to do. The reason they're expensive and the reason they take so long to build is because we need greater centralization that can decide on a single model to just stamp out. We need to accrue experience. This is a long-term thinking. I don't ever want to turn my back on the future. But what I can say is that I don't want to bet on it either. Luck isn't a plan. There's so much that's baked into that idea about we'll just innovate our way out of it. I don't think people understand it's actually just like almost a little bit of magical thinking going on there.